Welcome to the special summer edition of The Open Educator, the best place to be on a Saturday morning. I would like to thank each of you for being here and taking that first step in growing personally and professionally. And I would like to encourage anyone with a camera to turn it on and listen with intention. The Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program at USF develops students in three main ways. And today we'll be talking, honing in on one of those pillars, pillar number two. But the first pillar is to develop students who create their own business. And of course, we have lots of alums who started their own business and recently one has sold it for multi-millions of dollars. Our second main pillar in developing students of entrepreneurship and innovation is the idea that entrepreneurship activity can happen within a firm, or we can see it as innovation or corporate innovation. And we have many students who have gone on to work for large companies, IBM, innovative companies, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, et cetera. And today's guest will be no doubt one of those sharing her experience with innovation in one of these creative and innovative companies. Lastly, we develop students to create and define careers they define themselves, not what others define for them. And we have several testimonies and examples from graduates who are creating mashing up careers that didn't exist before. Literally this past year, I have a student who launched her music career and is now uh, known as Sacred Snow and blowing up the charts um, and redefining what careers and, and we'll say entrepreneurial or innovative activity can be applied to different industries. And I'm proud to announce that our next guest is someone who's not only a USF MBA alum, but deeply entrenched in this notion of corporate innovation, the role it plays for not only the firms that she's worked at, which are very famous ones and large ones and well-established ones, but also in helping others be more innovative. And that's a unique perspective she brings uh, for our class, Innovation and Dolly, and for the content that we cover. And she's always willing to come back and support current MBA students or connect with alums. And this is really what differentiates the USF MBA program, particularly the online courses, because we're here, regardless if we're virtual, standing shoulder to shoulder to be the better versions of ourselves, even if it's Saturday morning. So our next guest will be sharing her experiences about working at IBM and AT&T. So please give a warm welcome and I'm happy to announce to the world, uh, sales director and technologist at Accenture, please welcome Giselle Gobbs. Giselle, thank you for thank being you. here today, <laughs> this Saturday morning. Where does this cast find you? And maybe can you bring us up to speed in what you've been working on? Sure. So um, good morning, everybody. And, and thank you again for joining on Saturday. I love to do this. Thank you again, Dr. Diaz. You know that I'm always um, happy to to come in and chat or mentor or be available for any of the students. Um, my pleasure. So this um, this is kind of a unique time for me. Um, I just started a new job in a new career in a new company as of three days. <laughs> so um, brand spanking new. I just went through orientation um, at Accenture. Um, I know that, you know, um, it's, I've spent most of my career at large corporations at, I started my career at IBM, then got sold over to AT&T, spent a good 20 years at AT&T, retired from AT&T, went back to IBM um, to fulfill like a client exec type role. And then this opportunity presented itself and um, I couldn't turn it down. So uh, I made the transition over to Accenture. I don't know if you guys know about it. It's a consulting firm. Um, it's bigger than I thought it was. Um, it has over 500,000 employees, I found out um, yesterday. So um, just great culture, super innovative, you know, and, and I feel like I've, you know, just to tie back to innovation, I've really tried to find innovative careers within the companies where I've been. I've always been drawn to, hey, how could we do this differently? How could we innovate? And even bring it forward to people that don't even know, right? Like, have you thought about doing it like this? Or why are you doing it like that? That sort of thing. So that's what I've um, kind of done most of my career. And and that's where I am. I'm, I'm brand spanking new, reinventing myself. 
Thank you for sharing that. And what's relevant here is a lot of individuals who go for their MBA are looking to either advance their career or pivot to new industries. And while I'm not quite sure if the companies you've worked for are considered in different industries, they certainly have different strengths or they're, they're large companies. But maybe you can share a bit about how you tra transitioned maybe in a few of these examples and particularly, you know, was there ways that you prepared yourself as you transitioned in your career? Yeah, so um, can I share? Okay, let me just share real quick this. Okay. This is not letting me share, maybe, maybe not. Um, it doesn't look like I can. Shannon, can you take, you know, if the yeah, code. um, are you using like the share right next to the mute button? Is it, do you have that option? Yeah. Um, hold on. Let me just dismiss that because I clicked on the share tray, but, um, open share tray. And then I don't think it allows me. I must have some kind of setting that it's not allowing me. But anyway, all right, I'll just I'll I'll, I'll talk through it. Okay. Um, so as I said, uh, I, I have a little bit of a of a unique story, um, and and you could probably call it of reinvention, innovation, just throughout my life, and not just in my career, just as a person. Um, I grew up in Venezuela. I, when I finished high school, I decided that I wanted to come to the United States to go to college. So I packed my bags. I looked at the map and I picked a place and Texas happened to be where I wanted to go for no good reason. And, um, and just showed up in Austin and said, okay, here I am. Where do I sign up? What do I do? So anyway, needless to say, it was a, a little bit of a learning curve to even figure out how to do things or what to do and, and how to get through it. But um, so had to quickly learn, uh, did get my undergrad degree in computer science, um, and then moved to Florida. I was lucky enough to be able to get a job as a computer programmer at IBM, starting right out of, out of college. No experience, no internship, nothing, right? Just they kind of took a risk and saw that, you know, that I was willing to come in and, and, and to, you know, get anything done and kind of attitude, right? Like attitude is everything type thing. So um, at IBM, as you all know, you know, IBM back, especially in the 80s, 90s was at, you know, at the forefront of every innovation and everything. So there was a, that was the place to be, right? And um, so learned a lot. We built the, you know, our networks. You know, the internet was just coming out. We rolled out network solutions to all globally, um, and just a tremendous amount of work there. And then going into AT and T, you know, again, everybody has draw. You know, you move forward, you fall backwards, right? So there were some, you know, things along along the lines of you know, resetting people's titles and losing your job and going back in, had to reinvent myself and got a position as a manager of contracts, which I knew nothing about. Um, but again, reinventing innovation, sure, you know, I, I'll figure this out, I'll do it um, in and back. And along that line, I figured out that probably getting my PMP as project management was a good idea uh, to get that credential everybody project manages something at some point, right? So it's always good to have that. So um, did that, uh, passed, got my PMP, and then did several things along the lines. At it, when I was at AT&T, somebody said something about some organization that wasn't effective or processes that weren't effective. And here's where the real innovation comes in. And that's when I, on my own, decided, you know what, let me look at these processes do some data studies on it and see, okay, how can we do this better? What are we doing? Where's our, how much money is this costing us, right? And, and, and then brought it forward to leadership and said, here's what I propose. Like, we need to do something about this. We need to change the way we do things. We need to bring in tools. We need to reorganize our people. And that's when 
I said, I need some new skills for this. And that's when I went back. So later in life, so it's only been what, four or five years since I went back and got my MBA to take those skills from some of the MBA classes, the innovation class, the reorg, you know, reorganization for structures class, all those classes, and bring it back to the business and be like, okay, now it's not just me talking, right? I have the knowledge I've done, you know, I did some, I took some of the um, classes in data science and things like that to bring forward this innovation. And oftentimes you have to sell it right within your own internal people to say, okay, it is worth it to do this. Um, so, and then now most recently at IBM, now I go to customers and I tell them we have a process on how to innovate, right? We bring them into the IBM garage. I'm probably jumping ahead of, of, of where we want to be, but, and, and how do we get you to innovate and to do things differently and to work, you know, work smarter and think and, you know, all the logos that we have um, to do that. So now it's really become imperative pre-COVID and post-COVID even more so companies realize that, you know, if you don't innovate, if you don't stay current, if you don't move your stuff to the cloud, if you don't go through the digital transformation, you know, all the keywords you're not going to survive, you know, I mean, look at Kodak, right? That's a classic example. So, so people are jumping on board, but a lot of them don't know how to start or what to do or, or, and, and that's where, you know, we can come in, anybody can come in and help them do that, you know, and help them get to show them, you know, whether it's building a roadmap or, you know, where you are, where you could be, where do you want to get, you know, what are your goals and, and that sort of thing. And that's why it's now kind of a service right, to come in and, and set that all up. This is wonderful, Giselle, because while I've spent a lot of time studying and researching IBM, because I spent three years in their IBM uh, Innovation Jam, but there's a history and it's really a wonderful case. When we talk about closed to open or these changes in paradigms, we often cite IBM. Why? What's unique about Giselle is that she worked at IBM when it was seen as the pinnacle innovator. And at that time, probably, and I don't know, dates, 90s, we'll just sure. say 99, okay, <laughs> sure, sure. But, but it, it, was, it was famous for the uh, computer. They had a computer division. They were into hardware, a lot of uh, networking and things like this and infrastructure, but things were evolving in technology and they had to totally change their culture and they re, Imagine that, which is some of the com conversation I would like to, to, to dig up because it really ties to the rubber meets the road of where a lot of the MBA students are trying to move that ball or create some momentum within their firm. So old legacy company was starting to fail and die in the 90s. They had to reimagine themselves culturally and organizationally. They implemented more of a service approach and selling services and embedding uh, I will say uh, uh, the new paradigm of innovation, partly open, partly service forward, forward um, and, and the pipeline of however they were creating that. And now they're reinvigorated. And as Giselle's mentioning, they have all these other tools to not only help them be innovative, but also help the clients that they have. So I, I kind of want to, you know, we can talk about how the, your unique experience about that culture changed. But I think what is most important is about this idea of selling innovation you have that unique experience but the students in the mba want to make change in the organization what tools tips or framework or roadmap can they do today right now that's under their control and that they can help their organization or at least their team be moving in that direction any tips sure so so one of the things that i always told my teams is don't innovate for the sake of innovating right? Don't take a process and automate it as it is. If it's a bad process, it's a bad process. You're going to automate a bad process. You're not doing anything, right? So I think a lot of people get caught up in the hype of, oh, we're innovating. Oh, we're doing this. We're doing that. But at the end of the day, you have to have a result that makes sense. Like, why are you doing this? What are you trying to achieve? And can you measure it, right? So, so I think in your respective businesses, I mean, everybody has this, right? There's always a process or a an area or something that is not working where it should right or it's either old and not relevant or the process is broken and it takes too long 
or it's not cost effective. I mean, there's got to be something, right? And and the best way to go forward internally to the business and say, look, his issue is really gathering your data around it, right? Because you can say, hey, there's a problem with this, but if you don't have your, <clears throat> excuse me, your data on what that problem looks like, like I'll give you an example. We had a process where we had to take stuff to a review board and it was, nobody rejected it ever from the review board. And I'm sitting there going, why do we have a review board if nobody's rejecting it? It's all going through. Like how many people sit on the review board? How long is it? Um, how many days a week? How many things come through? Who who gathers the data around this? You know, what does, what is this actually doing? And the, and the issue was, is they'd been doing this for years. Oh, we can't do, we have to have the review board. We've been doing it forever, right? And how do you, how do you go against that? And when somebody thinks that it's so important, but they can't tell you really why, right? So that's when I did all the data mining and, and, I, and I went through and I said, okay, let me show you data-wise how much this is costing you. Here's how many people sit on the call. Here's an average hourly rate of the people that you have. Here's how many calls you have a week. And this is how much it's costing you. Now, let me tell you how many things are you putting through this process and how many get rejected and how many, you know, and then everybody's like, wow, I can't believe this is costing us $3 million a year. Yeah. That's what it's costing you. And it's not doing, you know what? And so if you put the data out there, then start, people start thinking and then you think, all right, could there be a different way to do this? Now I get it that, that somebody needs to review it. I get all that, but Maybe we can do an electronic review. You know, you get it in an email, you press a button. Maybe certain things can be pre-approved and they don't have to go through. So that's when you start throwing ideas out and that's when you start getting kind of everybody into the boat thinking. And that's where a lot of the design thinking comes into play, right? Where we did the sticky notes, you know, no ideas, any bad idea, what do you think? And when you bring the customer, because in this time, this is your internal customer, to the table and come up with these things, it's amazing what you can come through. And, and what we ended up doing is actually, so I did some research on tooling, right? You know, what kind of tools are out there that would facilitate this, that would make it quicker, easier. And then you look at the results. Hey, if we did it this way, we would save $3 million and a process that takes 10 hours could go down to three minutes. Okay, now I'm listening, right? Um, and by the way, if you look for some data on other people that have done the same thing, that's even better because then you can say, hey, we did this for Joe down the street who does your same thing. And these were the results that he had. Now they're really listening because they can relate. They're like, hey, I want to be, you know, but, well, if he did it, then yeah, we could do it. I'm wondering if anyone had a reaction to Giselle's story of Wow, that takes a lot of effort to collect the data, assuming the data is available, to find comparisons, to put it in a way that some old legacy mindset would be able to comprehend or be even open to consider. So what I want to highlight is this. We may be dreamy and may be in love with this idea of innovation, but it takes hard work. And the first part of what the example that Giselle mentioned is how to get people on board. And she's talked about collecting the data, framing it in a way, finding comparisons and, and costs and, and other things. But that's not sexy. That is, you know, that's, that's the grunt work in order to make change. So you have a decision where I, I guess what I'm saying is you as a leader in your MBA and your, in your program and, and your, your position, what role do I really want to, I'm going to get punched in the face, but in order to get punched in the face, I have to do all this grunt work and get training, which is the data collection or however you're organizing it, that, like the example Giselle and then go back to your, what, your bosses, your vice presidents, your pres whoever you have to go to get buy-in for to change just this simple initiative. So this is the ruggedness of what this individual needs to be made of, right? They're going, they're going to be laying mines along the path. They're going to be putting bumps in the road. And you have to do all that prep work, right? That's like the preparation for the marathon before you even start it, which is kind of the presenting of the material to whoever to make change. How does any, I guess, so is that, 
kind of a feeling that you got that you experienced or am I over exaggerating and dramatizing the, the experience of what it means to be an innovator? <laughs> no, no, you're not, you're not dramatizing at all. I think, you know, just to add on to that, it's a lot of grunt work, like you said, and a lot of gatherings. So it's important to have a really good team that you can send out to do the different things and kind of quarterback everything because you can't do everything by yourself. Right. So it definitely takes a team. But the other thing is that, it really takes passion. You have to be passionate about that change and about that, what you're doing. Because if you don't really care that much, then you're not gonna get all the stuff. But if it really gets under your skin or you really believe that it needs to change or to be a different way, I think that's the key differentiator because then you're just gonna keep being like hard-headed about it and like, no, you know, listen to me, like it could be like this and, you know, and. and but, you know, you, you and you have to have a great team of people that are with you, um, because if if people really don't care that much, then it's not going to happen, which is probably why it still works the way it works, because people sometimes often don't care that much about it. I, I'm starting to see this idea of innovator or change maker. And then what you did in terms of selling innovation to your client as almost one in the same. This idea of selling your idea, selling your innovation, selling this change or solution, I guess, is there a method that you use in order to sell innovation internally and or externally? And are they this, the same or different? So I think they're similar um, because in essence, you're selling the idea to somebody, whether it's internal or external, it's a little bit different. Now, the the it's easier to sell it externally because you you are having somebody come to you going, I have a problem and I need you to help me fix this, right? So you already have that piece of the recognition. Now, they might not know what type of a problem it is, how big it is, how small it is. So you still have to do some of the grunt work of getting the information around it. But at least you have somebody that's willing to come to the table and, and work with you on looking at different ways of doing things. Um, internally, you might have people that are like that, but you also might have people that are digging their heels in and they don't, you know, they're very comfortable. They don't want to change. I mean, talk about the phone company, right? I worked for AT&T for 20 years. I mean, you can't get anybody to do anything differently at AT&T. I mean, we all know, and we all suffer for, for it. Right. So that is hard. And I actually was working at AT&T when AT&T brought IBM in to do a design thinking and to do an innovation in one of their processes. And, and, and I was the customer at the time instead of being uh, on the IBM side. So I experienced the IBM methodology as a customer, and then I experienced it as an IBMer. So I've been on both sides of the fence. And, and, and again, it's called a methodology because it is, it is a method, right? I mean, they, of course, every process and everything is different and, and you mold to it, but basically the, it, it does have a beginning, middle and end, and they, and they talk about the peaks and the, you know, and the different things, but it, it is gathering, you know, how it's working today, all the data around it, putting it all on the table and saying, okay, what is it that you want it to look like? And let's, let's build right that roadmap and, and let's, and again, not do it for the sake of doing it. And, and oftentimes we came to the conclusion where we can't change this. It's going to be too expensive to change it. There's no good or better way to do it. We're not going to apply a tool just to say that we applied a tool. So sometimes you could end up with a no game and that's okay. So it, you know, just to, to kind of circle back to that, um, I think, IBM has done a very good job with their garage method. I mean, it is, a, I would encourage you guys to go to the website. Um, it's, it's a public website, you know, IBM.com, I think slash garage or something like that. And I could share it, but I can't share it. Um, there's a, uh, a nice tutorial. There's a walkthrough. It talks about co-creating and, 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 and doing different things. It talks, of course, it's all related to digital transformation and bringing innovation, but, you know, transformation in a way that gives you, you know, value. And they're, they, they quote numbers like, you know, the average ROI is like 102% on, on what you're doing. So um, 
I would encourage you guys to go out there. It's, it's fun. They have little, you know, emojis and things that walk you through and you can look at what the methodology looks like. And it does make sense. Um, I don't think it's anything that you guys are going to look at and go, wow, I never thought of this, but somebody took it and kind of put it, you know, on a piece of paper, marketed it and, and is taking it to customers and, and, and working with them. So I just want to continue to make this thread. IBM has shifted to a service-based approach to, to transform its past culture. One of the things it does in terms of its repertoire is help organizations be more innovative. They have a whole set of toolkits that are, we'll say, different models to help innovate. Not so different than what you're actually learning in innovation in DALI. Many of them the same if it's design thinking, we talk about innovation jams, we talk about the garage, we talk about maybe labs. And I'm not suggesting in your organization, you run out to try to create all of these in your firm. This is a long decade after decade process to be able to build out this capacity. But the point is maybe there are nuggets or forms or models or approaches that you can adopt within your unit, within your team, within like-minded, that can be a test bed to possibly grow. Remember, in order to scale, it takes exactly what Gis Giselle mentioned earlier, this ruggedness, this constant grinding, but there are things under your control. So I'm wondering, while we named all of these many or many different approaches that IBM used, maybe you can elaborate a bit more, Giselle, on what the labs are or what the garage is. You talked a little bit about design thinking or innovation. Jam. It's not that one is the silver bullet for any one company, but just know that IBM has developed these over many years and had pivoted to selling innovation. So that's one of their core competencies to, in order to, uh, to provide a service. But maybe you could share a bit more about what, what a lab does compared to a garage, maybe the design thinking and or innovation jam or any other tools that IBM might use. Right. So, um, so all those tools that, that IBM uses, right, it really depends on the customer and on the situation and what they're trying to do. So it's just different versions of, some of kind of the same methodology, right? So there's a big push right now for digital transformation, for customers to move their businesses to the cloud to, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, Kubernetes and putting things in containers so that way you can move your, you know, your applications from one place to another. Um, and then it won't matter, you know, what cloud you're on and those sort of things. So customers look at all that and they like, yeah, we need to modernize, right? We need to get to the cloud. We need to get off of these, you know, dinosaur mainframe systems. And, and I know it sounds counterintuitive that IBM would be wanting to get people off of mainframes, but yes, because that is the future, right? To get people off of mainframes. So as part of the, you know, digital transformation, they will come in and tell the customer, look, I know that you don't know where to start. So we'll come in and we'll do, you know, I think it's a week or two week IBM garage, right? And that's where the IBM garage is applicable. And part of the IBM garage, right? The outline of it, and I don't know the exact, you know, ins and outs, because I don't run that part of the business, but the basic, you know, um, is let's sit down. Where are you, right? Where, what, what are all your applications? What is it? Where are everything, right? Where are your workloads? What are you doing? What, snapshot of where you are today, right? Where you want to get to tomorrow. And, and then there's a lot of the ideation around, you know, how can we do that? What would work best? There's a lot of information around what kind of tools you can use, what kind of, you know, clouds would be best for certain applications and things. So there's a lot of information given, but there's also, you know, one of the things that they do other than the stickies and letting everybody, you know, put stickies on the problem, there's role-playing as well, right? There's a lot of, hey, if you could do it any way you wanted to do it and, it, it, you know, throw everything out the window, what would it look like for you? Right. And so there's a lot of value in that, too. And some of these things are, you know, people come up with crazy ideas, but there's value in that. Right. They're like, oh, I want my eyeballs to beam the idea from here to there. Like, you know, but and that's OK, because then you have to translate that into what is it really that, that you want to do? If I can just make a bridge. So what Giselle is mentioning in terms of the garage, in terms of going into a client and, and utilizing this initial approach 
is very similar to what you're doing in the project, right? I suggest that you needed to do some research, you needed to do some interviews. We can broadly call this the discovery phase. You're getting familiar with this type of environment, right? And you have your own project for the, for the, for the class, but it's no different than IBM clients working in this garage and helping to understand the ground, the situation that that company's in or the manager or the executive team and where they want to go. While we also have that prototyping or that role playing also embedded in our project where we are creating that prototype. And because things aren't linear, we might be doing them at different times, but we want to suggest we are utilizing that same approach maybe in a slightly different fashion, this digital fashion, we're using how might we tools, value propositions, briefs, research, data, all as a form of discovery, not so different than that garage method that that Giselle just mentioned. And then she talks about what would be next, the ideation. We learned about an ideation method, how might me, we and, and other approaches to the sticky that is used. So I want to suggest we are doing that and we could see it, even though I don't necessarily frame it as a garage, but we're doing that same discovery within our class, within our project. I'm oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so maybe you could share a little bit more about, so after you have a, an idea about what the company is trying to solve for or the situation, is there a next logical step that might IBM might use to help them? Well, yeah, because because <laughs> it's all about selling, right? So the next logical step is IBM can step in and help them, right, um, get to where they want to be. So when you look at this, so we give you the roadmap and then really the ultimate um, outcome of the roadmap is, first of all, for the customer to see, OK, there is a way to get to where I need to be. And then that's where IBM comes in and says, we can help you get there. Right. And that's where they sell their services on how to help them get there. So whether it's people that they assign, whether it's, you know, whatever it is that they move into the cloud, set up their cloud, you know, they can get them where they need to be. Just to make a final bridge, at least related to the project, what are one of the things that you were expected to do for your midterm and certainly the final presentation is to create a roadmap? How would you execute this? Who would be the stakeholders? What resources would you need? What is the timeline? and to create a minimal viable product for at least our situation. So you could see that you're actually doing that all within our class, all within the project and within this sprint that we're doing to learn. What would be the next step, Giselle? After the roadmap, the implementation of the different things. And, and, and I like that you said sprint because everything is very much related to, right, the agile type of doing things. Um, so they would, you know, we would put things in small chunks or sprints um, with some de small deliverables along the way so the customer could see some progress, right? So um, that obviously is the longest piece, is the implementation piece. Um, and it could take, depending on what they're doing, it could take up to years to get that done. I liked how Giselle shared this idea of sprint uh, and the importance of it, which our class is six weeks, really five weeks. That's a sprint right there. And yeah. when you talk about agile, they break it down into weeks, depending the situation and have a scrum, have have these, yep. these pow powwows. So this is no different than some of the uh, tools, techniques, best practices of what companies do to innovate, to be a leader, to be best practices. Uh, while I'm not necessarily training you on agile or sprints per se, we are learning and by doing, uh, executing this project. Wonderful. Um, anything to add or maybe you could I, I was just going to give an example. Yeah, I was just going to give an example with the, with the sprint and so forth. And, and just because I came from the old methodology of you gathered all the requirements and you spent a lot of time gathering requirements and then you went off and you did your thing and then you came and you delivered it, you know, a year later and they were like, and this isn't what I wanted. Right. So I'm a true believer in, in the agile and the sprint. And when I was at at and I was tasked to roll out service now, which was a tool that was deemed important to, to roll into for, for that. So I did have a team of scrum and, and product managers and developers and everything to do that. And I think 
we were successful because we did have that methodology, right? We were able to keep showing the customer, hey, here's a tiny little bit. Look, this is what it looks like. Oh, you want to change this field? Right? And you change things on the fly even, right? And not even in a sprint and kind of keep going and moving in another piece, because I think it's really important as part of the getting people on board internally to get where you're going is, is to do that, right? A proof of concept is also another great tool that we use um, to say, all right, you don't believe in this, but let me show you, right? I recently um, helped a customer do some, um, some data uh, analysis. They had data like in 13 different places all over, not unlike probably any of the companies that you work for, right? They have data in 13 different pl places and they wanted it in one single place. And really sitting down and talking to them and going through a little bit of a design thinking, really what they wanted is they wanted to access the data quickly and have it seem to be together. It didn't really matter. So what we did is we did kind of like um, a data virtualization solution where the data could stay where it was, but it looked like it was all together because we were pulling it all together and showing it to them probably 17 times faster than they could ever get it. Now, they were a little skeptical. So what we did is we did a proof of concept. So we took that software and we installed it. We accessed one of their systems and we actually showed them what it looked like and how it could work. And they were like, oh my God, this is the best thing ever. And then we kind of move forward. So proof of concepts and pilots and things in short sprints where people can actually see what you're trying to do are a great tool. Hopefully, this is something that you guys can take with you for our project, which is something that I've been pushing in terms of creating this prototype, making it visual, at least testing certain assumptions with even a very, very low res or basic prototype can answer some of the broader assumptions to know if you want to move on or which way to pivot based off of, of the direction of your project. So wonderful. I hopefully we're able to connect some of these dots and these threads that can help us in our uh, careers, but also our project. I'm wondering, you know, we, we, we learn a lot in our class and the many tools and toolkits and techniques and approaches. But since you have this unique experience of selling innovation and we don't want to just drink the Kool-Aid, we want to have a he healthy dose of skepticism to help better prepare ourselves instead of just blindly drinking the Kool-Aid. So what's happening on the ground? Is it really innovation that important to organizations or is it just a buzz? Or is there something that's not being said that really needs to be said? It's definitely important, right? I mean, companies are realizing and I'm sure where you guys are as well is if you don't innovate, if you're not relevant, if you don't keep up with the times, it's, you know, you're not going to succeed. And um, there are even, I had a customer <laughs> here in Tampa um, who actually wasn't sure what he needed to innovate with, but he wanted me to sit down and tell him what other people were doing because he had a little bit of FOMO. So he's like, Tell me what everybody else is doing. I want to be on the same page. You know, what should I be doing? Right. And and so there is a lot of opportunity to help people with previous experience to say, hey, OK, here's what so and so is doing. Are you doing something similar? Do you want to let you know, how do we get you there? Right. But it's all about it has to be smart. It has to be a result that makes sense to the customer. If it doesn't make sense and if it isn't anything that's real or that, you know, that they find valuable, then again, don't innovate for the sake of innovating. But I don't think there's any company out there right now that can stay doing what they're doing now and not change and not innovate and not do things better because other people will and they'll be left behind. Before we open the floor for questions because I know there will be many, uh, because this is really where the rubber meets the road. The challenges that we face to try to innovate, to make change, and we have an expert who has done that on many sides of the fence uh, within this field. But I'm, I'm curious to know, maybe if we can bring it home, bring it back down to, 
how or what did you learn in the MBA that you were able to apply or that impacted your career the most? You know, the students are at different phases of their MBA program, uh, some in the beginning, some in the end, some in the middle. They want to take actionable steps to better prepare themselves to take that next leap. Is there some advice there or maybe tied to innovation or not, but is there, you know, what, um, within your experience of the MBA at USF, how, how could they better prepare themselves to apply that content? Yeah, so uh, for me, obviously the, you know, I went seeking for the MBA for, for help, right? Because I knew that I needed to bring some new concepts and some new knowledge and again, right? Innovate and an MBA from 2017 is not the same MBA that you had in, you know, 1989. So I think it was good for me to actually do it recently and be able to bring, I mean, just the data science, right? And data mining and, and, and that, I took one of the electives there that, you know, that just brushed upon the different tools of, you know, Hadoop and this and that. I mean, that was a phenomenal class. I would definitely recommend that. Obviously, the innovation class, right, with Dr. Viasso. I mean, that that was great. Eye-opening, you know, look at things differently. Organizational structures. I know everybody's scared of that class. Don't be scared of that class. That is a great class. It's a lot of good information on um, organizations. So I really, honestly, um, and, and Sienna, we were talking about this earlier, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing wrong with any of the classes. You will take something out of every single class that you can apply. Um, I think I came in with fresh eyes, wanting to look at things and, and bringing it back, right? So um, I think it's helped me beyond what I intended it to help, right? Because not just credentials, but just a way of looking at things and understanding things and just the whole business financials and everything. Now, remember, before I took an MBA, I'd spent a lot of time in the business world, but I had a computer science and chemistry degree. So I was not versed, right? What I had learned, I had learned kind of working. Now I could talk circles around our finance people, but I didn't have the official education. So I think the credentials and the way of looking at things had then set me up when IBM came knocking again, like, wow, okay, now you have all this other stuff. We really want you to come back and work for us. And, you know, again, and one more time now at Accenture, now you have all the IBM um, experience, right, as a client exec, which owns the whole customer, right? So it was responsible for everything IBM to the customer, um, plus the MBA, plus all the knowledge, you know, it all adds up. So I can't say enough about how helpful it was. I think I came in with fresh eyes and um, looking at things from already being in the business for a long time and really trying to take those pieces that you're saying and just bring it back. Your comments, I was always trying to apply it, always trying to apply it. Which is should be the fundamental goal of the MBA program and the content that you're being taught. Your answer reminds me of a, an ancient proverb the teacher will appear when the student is ready. And I hear Giselle coming in with this hunger, this openness, beginner's mindset, or whatever we want to, or learner's mindset, or whatever we want to call it, and looking to grab and apply, grab and apply like a, a bank robber, right? You're, you're taking it and you're applying it in your, your toolkit and you're, you're going to execute it. Yeah. And, and also sharing, right? So I remember the first class I took was a global business class or international business class or something like that, where I had been in the global business for a very long time. And I found it interesting because I was able to share a lot of things with other people of, of my experiences, which was really a lot around South America and rolling out networks in South America. And the uh, professor was more Asia uh, centric. So there was a lot of information sharing, which I thought was great, um, especially for us here in the area. I mean, let's face it, Tampa Bay is like not the, you know, New York City or Washington, you know, so it's hard to really come to places and share this kind of business intelligence, which I found very helpful. I'd like to open the floor for questions from the audience. What questions do you have for Giselle? Uh, maybe sp company specific? or career oriented or MBA oriented, uh, I would like to open the floor. Anything you got people? Quick question. Uh, good morning. Go ahead. Go ahead, Michael. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, quick question for you, Giselle. So 
I guess, yeah. what are some sources that you've utilized in the past to kind of incorporate open innovation into some of the, I guess, processes that you've improved over over your career? And how would one maybe better identify some sources to utilize for the open innovation concept? Sources as far as tools to use to do it or? Well, I, I guess like people? for me, when I look at open innovation, where if I'm looking for, you know, ideas or concepts outside of my organization, what might be a good resource for me to identi better identify um, maybe where to find some information? Yeah, so um, so one of the things you can go to is the IBM website for IBM Garage. There's a ton of free information out there, and they talk about their methodology. They'll talk about each one. You can go into that um, and take a look and see if there's anything useful in there for you. Um, a lot of times, if you're looking at a specific process, um, if you have a tool or have anybody that's good with B. PMP that, that does the business drawings, which is not a Visio, but it's an actual, I don't know if you guys do BMP or not. Um, and um, that's very helpful, right? To kind of set the stage of what does it look like now? And then um, be able to go to kind of each part of the process and get an idea of how long does it take to do this? And I know that's really hard because a lot of people don't know right? They're like, ah, I think it takes me a couple days. All right, but just put something down, you know, kind of thing. Well, let's put something down. Let's, let's see, you know, what it's like. And then understand, right? And then just do some research. I mean, I just did research, like Google type research on tools. Um, and then on some, if, if you're part of any kind of business groups, if you sit on any board, if you have any kind of business relationships with per possibly people in your industry, right? So if you guys have an energy um, forum or something where you share ideas, you can perhaps say, oh, hey, I know that Florida Power implemented SAP for this process, and they're able to do the same thing that I do in three days, and I, here I am, it takes me 35 you know, days to do it. Maybe they'll be able to do that. I, um, one of my customers was in the automotive industry, an automotive, automotive distributor, and um, they're looking to implement some kind of ERP solution. And when I told them, hey, here's the other guy over on the other side that is exactly like you, and they just implemented it, and here's what it looks like, that's very helpful. So if you look within your industry and see what they're doing, if you know people that are in the same industry, that's very helpful too. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. If I, if I could just add on, that is a great question, Jeff. Think of it this way. You know, whatever role you play, it might be there might be many people who have a play a similar role at many other similar types of industries or companies. And maybe a form of open innovation is creating some sort of forum, community, association of those. And it's not about competition, it's about sharing because yeah. if that person wants to get yeah. promoted just like you want to get promoted. And maybe there are best practices in sharing and knowing the ins and outs or the challenges at one com company compared to another. So that would be a form of community building, possibly wisdom of crowds, certainly collective intelligence, and utilizing external knowledge. Of course, it takes work to create that, but things don't just happen like magic. This is the grinding. And then there's probably you know a level up, a level down. Maybe the community is now bigger. That could be a forum. That could be a, a meet and greet. That could be many different types of things or um, ways to arrange that type of knowledge sharing that ultimately would help you apply that external knowledge into your situation. So th those are one of many. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so so like at AT&T, right, we have a lot of good friends at Verizon. So there's a lot of good information sharing, like, well, did you know that Verizon doesn't do that? They do this. And it's like, whoa, okay, so if Verizon can do it, they're giving the same service, you know, maybe we should start looking at, you know how it is. I mean, it's just human nature, right? Um, so, so there is a lot of value in that. There's also, um, if you look, there's conferences that are industry specific that you can attend. A lot of them, some of them are virtual now. So most of them are free. So if you look at SAP, you look at Oracle, you look at all the vendors and the tools, they will usually have a industry specific type conference and best practices. And, and you can go to their websites and look up 
even IBM has by industry. The industry that I supported was manufacturing and industrial. So there's lots of, base, you know, electronics has a best practice and they will publish those things for people to go see what the best practice is. So you can read up on that. And that also gives you ammunition internally to say, did you know, you know, Forrester says or IBM says that he, here are some of the best practices. So that is great information to have. Okay. And while, while these big consulting firms may work with certain industries, they may have, like Giselle said, these, these reports or white papers. But even if it's the questions or challenges that you're facing are at a micro level or, or a meso level or a micro level that aren't necessarily directly tied to that report, I can guarantee that there will be small boutique consulting or service oriented firms that are out there looking or have the ability that want to consult with or do kind of like this automation of different services. And while maybe they're not just robotics or whatever, they're trying to streamline certain services that may be the same problems that you're facing. So that might take a different level of, of, of uh, digging. I know personally, locally, um, some alum have started a, uh, they call Mr. Automation, and they go in and help provide tools. They know all these tools, you know, app-based and big software-based, and how, what problems they're best suited for. And then, you know, you can just mix and match or match those, how that fits. So there's many approaches or levels of, of tapping into this external knowledge, but it takes work. You know, it doesn't magically happen overnight. Wonderful question. What other questions do we have for Giselle? I think somebody else was going to beep in. Uh, good morning, Ms. Gover. Uh, good morning, uh, Dr. Diasio, uh, Michael Brito here. Um, thank you for sharing uh, this morning, uh, all the information. Uh, I just want to say that um, I was looking at your biography and uh, uh, the main point that you make about Scrum Master, uh, Master uh, Business Analysis and Development. I'm also taking uh, project management right now, and we are studying that. Um, we're about to finalize everything, but we are studying uh, product owner, uh, Scrum Master. I just want to know uh, how did that um, help you or use that knowledge to help you with the development uh, area? Um, so, yeah, no, great question. So the the project management knowledge and, and just, you know, and, and really the scrum and everything that we talked about knowledge um, is, bit, I think it's helpful and everything that you do, because at the end of the day, I feel like I'm always managing a project. Regardless of what you're doing, you're always managing something, right? Just like you're always selling something. I don't care if you're in sales or you're not in sales, you're always selling something, whether you're selling yourself, an idea, a product, something, you're always selling something. So I think it was very important, first of all, you know, this is a very credential driven um, society. So to get the credentials is important to have it. If you ever need to, specifically just do project management, you know that you're going to be qualified above everybody else because you have a PMP. So that's very important. It's important to keep it current. And in keeping it current, it's required 60 hours of continuous education. And that's great because then that obligates you to go in and take different classes and stay current with all the methodologies, right? So, you know, Microsoft Project was really big when I did it. And I did, a, you know, probably, I don't know how many classes of Microsoft Project and everything. And now we have so many other tools, right? Asana and this and that. And, and you know, you stay relevant. And again, it's about being efficient at what you do, keeping organized. I feel like it helps. I mean, I project manage everything. I project managed our vacations. I project managed our family reunions, like everything gets project managed, right? Because you want it to go smoothly. You want it to be effective. So, and with the scrum and the sprint and everything, I think it's very important again, because you can show that progress and you can pivot quickly if you're not doing the right thing. If you're completely off base, you know, it's like lose quick <laughs> and, and, and start over kind of thing. So those were the two things that were really, really important, especially rolling out a tool, right? Or doing some development work, whether you're doing the development in-house or if you decide to implement a tool. Um, I think that methodology is key, especially 
in this day and age. Everything is so quick and we're so used to having, you know, just a response times that are quick. We can't afford to do it any other way. I don't know if that helps that I answer your question. Yes, thank you so much. I'm going to make a yes, Michael. <clears throat> hey, good morning, Giselle. Thanks for your time. Uh, I'm just curious that uh, either at your time at IBM, I guess the the first go around was maybe in the kind of the glory days, or even at AT and T. But how? Um, how did the organization provide resources and encourage innovative ideas? So we had a we had um, you know a guest speaker that we talked to a week ago and a couple of weeks back. But I'm just curious at an organizational level if if employees have new ideas, how do they get the organization to support first of all the culture of that, and secondly uh, provide some resources to throw at these ideas to kind of get them legs and get them off the ground. Thank you. Yeah, no, that that's a great question because I feel like I've been in every shade of that. <laughs> so I've been in, like you said, in the glory days, right, of IBM where there was a ton of resource. You wanted to do something, you came up with an idea, they encouraged it, they had a place where, you know, kind of like the idea box. And if everybody thought it was great, they gave you a bunch of resources, you went, you did it, you showed it. So, so those were the good days, right? The good days are over because nobody really does that anymore. Um, AT&T was a little bit different. AT&T um, had a little bit of innovation. So they had the idea box, your idea got nominated. It was a little more convoluted, but at at and what I found was I had to be the initiator of that movement, right? So I was the one that had to do the internal selling of here's the problem. Here's what I think the solution is or how the process needs to change or what we need to do. Here's all the analysis around it, right? The data that we talked about, the ROI, which is super important, right? Because it's, it's not a positive ROI. Nobody wants to talk to you about it and, you know, and bring it forward. And once you do that in your business calculation of ROI and how you're putting this together, you need to include those resources that you're going to need to do this. Right. So if you figured out, hey, if you give me three or four people, here are the type of people that I need, right? Because you'll need different, you know, skills. This is how long it'll take me to get this to do this. And here's the outcome. And and, and you include that in your ROI. Right. So that's kind of part of your selling job. Now, back at IBM and more so here at Ex at Accenture, I've noticed, of course, I haven't been here that long, but there is a stronger sense of innovation and and more of a pride in pushing people to think differently and to bring things forward and once you can but again it, it's it's hard because people are not going to you might think your idea is great but not everybody's going to jump on that boat with you right so it's all about how you present it and how you set up that business case for it and that's how you push it forward in this day and age is what I've found, right? Because I don't think there are a lot of companies out there that are just like, sure, bring me your idea and, you know, I'll, I'll do anything you want to do kind of thing. It's all about the business case and, and the result. Does that help? But you have to include your resources and what you need, it, even if it's a tool, if it's people, if it's both, whatever it is that you need, you need to include that in your business case. One of the hopes, uh, my feeling is, or my hope at least, is the project that we're working on reflects that exact same process. While I give some broad themes or broad context, Ultimately, the business case and the argument for that solution that you're building for the Sun Coast area falls on you to craft that, find that data, craft that story, roadmap it, prototype it, which is ultimately what we're talking about needs to happen in order for you to make change in your organization. Yeah, and, and I think the key thing is, is when you guys put that together, um, you know, it, it you have to have the right outcome. So you can't invest 
$100,000 to get a return of $10, right? So, because then nobody's going to want to do that. That could be the best innovative idea ever, but nobody's going to want to do that, right? Unless you can show seven years out what your return is going to be. But you've got to show that. I mean, there's got to be value in what you're doing. And that might be for private business. I know many people work for the public industry or government, and maybe those outcomes are different. It's not just ROI, but maybe impact on society or access to drinking sure. water. So th there might be. But it's got to be a outcomes. positive. It's got to be a positive, right? So you can't. So so let's say you're you're going after clean water. You can't pollute everything to get to the clean water, right? So there there always has to be a positive outcome. Wonderful. This has been fascinating, Giselle. And I have so many more questions, and but we only have so much time as well. And I would like to, one, give you the floor. If students wanted to reach out to you, build their network, pick your brain, can you give them the location of how they can connect with you? And then I have one more final question for you. Yeah, for sure. And and I shared this with Sienna. Happy to help anybody, mentor anybody, take a look at the project, give you my opinion or not, or you can tell me I'm crazy. I, I'm good with that. Um, my uh, idea is Giselle Gobes, so G-I-S-E-L-E-G-O-B-E-S, -E -E Giselle Gobes at gmail.com. Um, and Sienna, you can probably send that out later, or it might even be on the flyer. Um, if you guys need to contact me for anything, absolutely available. I would love to help. Um, you know, a, just a different set of eyes on the project if you want, or even if you have things going on at work or like, yay, you know, I just need to bounce this off of somebody. Happy to do that. I was sharing with Sienna. I have a group of um, individuals that I mentor on a regular basis. So, uh, you know, happy to to help in, in any way and just, you know, kind of use some of the wisdom of having been there, done that type thing, or have you thought about this? Um, happy to help. So I'm going to make a strong encouragement for all students to utilize it. This is why we create the open educator. And what I would argue is the greatest value of the MBA program is connecting. So if you want to build your skills, and of course, we don't know everything and we're not learning everything in the program, but the network that we build because we attend these sessions, because we make the effort to connect with Giselle or Stenio or Riley, and many of these are alum from the program who are spending their time to be with us today or every day on the Open Educator. This is how you make innovation happen. Overcome these boundaries, learn from the outside, apply to your internal company. It doesn't just come like magic, you have to make that effort. And this is why I kept pushing you to attend or why I do this, because of these are the tools that will help you in order to make those changes that you want in your organization, Michael, in your organization, Michael, and in your organization, Jeffrey, mm -hmm. and, and the rest of you. So thank you for being here. Lastly, Giselle, I always ask my uh, guests, if you could go back to your younger self, what advice would you have for her? <laughs> um, if I could go back, I would say definitely take any opportunity you have for free education. Don't turn it down um, or education, depending on how it is. Um, I think I talked to Sienna about that a little bit. And I wish I would have taken more business classes and more business administration classes earlier on than I didn't. Um, and you guys probably are all undergrad business students, so that's not really relevant to you guys, but, um, I think that's one of the things that I probably would have done differently. Um, and probably not relevant to you guys either, but internships I think would have been key um, to do that. But that's part of, I feel like what you're doing here is connecting to the outside world, right? So that's what the internships I think would have done for me um, would to be to have that connection to where when I graduated, I was like, I have no idea how to apply this. I think you're on mute. 
thank you, Giselle, for spending the morning <laughs> with us. I think there are some fascinating good nuggets that we can apply in our toolkit right now. Maybe it also frames how that design sprint or the sprint that, innovation sprint that we have for our six week MBA course well, is applicable to what skills we need to in practice. Uh, if you want to continue building these skills, the management design thinking course will be offered. And then of course, improv for, for business, which is building a culture for innovation. I can't thank you enough, Giselle. Uh, I will be in touch with you shortly and to follow up, but um, thank you for spending this time with us on The Open Educator. My pleasure. Thanks, guys. Good luck. Thank you. Have a good morning. Bye. Thank you. Have a good morning.